So thank you so much for a, a very interesting talk and paper. Uh, so I have several questions, but I will start to start with just one and then uh, leave the word to somebody else. Is that correct? Uh, so my first question is about uh, one of the evidence uh, that you provide for the uh, Amodol uh, theory concept, uh, in particular the apraxia case. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, a deficit that I studied a little bit uh, for my work on motor skills. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an extremely interesting case for a variety of reasons. Um, I was thinking that maybe the argument that you give is a little bit too quick um, mm -hmm. against the uh, new, uh, new emphasis for the following reasons. So um, the argument you, you give is the following. So suppose uh, so these subjects um, uh, seem to uh, be unable to reenact re the use of tools, uh, you know, these uh, uh, subjects, for example, are not even able to pantomime the use of uh, tools like hammers, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, but they are perfectly good at um, describing verbally the task and also at recognizing um, the, the tool uh, in question. Um, and so uh, the objection to the uh, new empiricists, as I understand it, is that if uh, the concept of a hammer, for example, uh, were identical with the, or, or the concept of uh, putting a nail on the <laughs> wall with a hammer um, had to do with a motor representation, uh, then given that in this subject the motor representation is impaired, um, uh, you should find um, deficit also in other areas of concept uh, used, like uh, in the, the recognition of <coughs> the tool or and the verbal ability to describe the task and so on. So uh, as I understand, uh, um, people working in this area, neuroscience, uh, like people like Daniel Warpert and uh, um, <coughs> Arbib and Jean Rod, they want to say that um, there isn't just one kind of motor representation. There's a whole hierarchy of motor representation. Um, so uh, they are very happy to posit very general sorts of motor representation, like motor schemas. Um, and more particular form of representations that are issued uh, when the task is, uh, uh, is actually performed, uh, like motor commands. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have this sort of hierarchy, then, you know, if I were somebody like Prince or, you know, empiricists in general, I would identify the concept with a more general representation that is standing from occasion to occasion. Um, and that's compatible with uh, the apraxia subjects who have the, the, the concept because there may be something uh, else going wrong uh, when they actually produce the task. Uh, the, the task. So when they try to perform the task, so there may be some problem in the motor planning process that goes from the you know, uh, intention and motor schema to the actually issuing the motor commands, or there may be just issues with the execution of the prescription by the motor commands and so on. So uh, I was thinking that there's more room for the neo empiricists to answer that sort of objection once you have a, some a kind of more complex uh, uh, picture of the sort of representation that involves in motor systems. So. Yeah. So, <laughs> should I respond now uh, or after? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, yeah, it, it's, um, it's a very helpful uh, comment and uh, I think, I think you, you, you're just right about the point you, you are absolutely making. I mean, it is true that uh, there's not a single motor representation, but a hierarchy of motor representation uh, and uh, involving actually, by in terms of, of uh, GRAN, also in terms of it, that content. Um, so I, 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 and I think that's right, that the empiricist could be appealing to that fact to respond to, to apraxia. Um, so, I think just, just uh, so I agree with you, just the phenomenon of apraxia is actually consistent with an empiricist theory of concept. What we want then to move the electric further, and uh, uh, in a sense that should be my task now, is to, uh, what was the good theory of apraxia that tells us which representation is going to be impaired in, um, uh, in apraxia. Just showing the double dissociation isn't enough. What we want is a causal understanding of the, of the, uh, of the, of the syndrome. Uh, and to be able to provide more compelling evidence, or to, and actually I think to provide evidence at all, against uh, the empiricist or the embodied model of concept, at least for action, concept of action, 
um, uh, I'd, I'd have to, I'd, I would have to show that the representations that are impaired are at a higher level and not and, and not, and not at, a, at a lower level. I, I actually I think that's a very uh, very helpful helpful point. Now the worry, of course, is that uh, you now we have of course models causal models of apraxia, but I'm not sure there's any consensus about uh, about exactly what the etiology of of apraxia is. Uh, so that may not carry as much dialectical weight as I was hoping as I was hoping it would. But I think that 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 that's that's, that's, that's an excellent response and, and it does sketch the way ahead to just look at the uh, etiology the etiology of apraxia. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so thanks for the talk. I guess um I got, I got a bunch of questions, but I guess the, the first one and the, the biggest picture one kind of comes down to the the by and large claim that you made in like the last sentence of your talk. Um so um, early on in Larry Barcelo's work, he was he re relied on this claim, and I forget exactly the terms he used to use. Um, kind of a surface versus deep processing claim about about thinking with modal systems. So, um, if I ask you what's bigger, a Learjet or a mouse, you don't need to do much uh, sophisticated perceptual simulation to answer that question. Um, but if I ask you what's bigger, uh, uh, a cat or a fox, then you're much more likely to uh, uh, call up um, perceptual representations that you can compare to answer that question. Uh, in more in more recent work, he he is much more willing to admit that there are, for instance, linguistic representations that are closer to the traditional amodal kind of system, um, and that in language processing, what those do is sort of index the embodied uh, grounded system, uh, which which computes the meaning in a number of ways. Um, so, I think both of those at least gesture towards the possibility that there could be some tasks which, at some level of complexity, operated a more at a more surface level, a more um, uh, uh, linguistic or amodal kind of level. Uh, but when you get into sort of deep deep processing, then there's uh, then there's a bigger reliance on modal systems. So, I guess what I'm wondering is. Uh, that doesn't seem to be incompatible with, with the evidence that you've suggested. So there might be high-level um, action concepts, high-level number concepts that, um, for certain kinds of tasks, we don't need to dive deeper into the into the modal systems. Um, but then it, it sounds like the difference is really not about what concepts are, but it's a question of of focus on certain tasks and for focus on certain uh, types of processing. And, and couldn't it be okay to say, well, yeah, in some cases there are some amoral representations, and say that the disagreement between you and Larry is really just um, how much of the work of thinking that you think these different representations can do? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, good. Um, so let's, uh, yes. Uh, so let's focus on the Bartholomew's early distinction between surface and, and, and deep. Now, uh, I, while I was sketching a response, you, you took that as you know, your, the end of your question. So, I mean, if, if Bartali's view uh, was that we use perceptual representation only in what he calls deep thinking, um, then I do worry that the contrast between an empiricist theory of concept and a not an immodal theory of concept uh, starts to get to get actually very blurry. It would seem that one way of describing the situation, forgetting a little bit about the label surface versus deep, which I think are very misleading. Um, uh, uh, some tasks are going to be re requiring perceptual representations because for vi for actually unspecified and empirically interesting reasons. Other tasks are going to uh, require representations that are, I would say, not perceptual. I do worry that Bassalo would want to say less perceptual, and I'd, I'd like to have a sense of what this gradient really is. Uh, but in any case, the contrast between our views really became, as I worry, partly terminological. We, in a sense, would agree that some tasks require uh, simulations, reenactment, and as a result, uh, using the type of representations that are involved in, in perception, or the task would not. Um, and uh, is that true? The way I've been framing the debate is actually 
mistaken in a sense we, we've converged toward an agreement i should say that it's good news for me because to the extent that my debate is is, is framed in terms of hume versus descartes it's a win for descartes <laughs> you know descartes got it right uh uh marron has called uh, uh, uh has drawn a contract between i think what he calls weak empiricism and strong empiricism something like that in the 2016 paper um and uh, in a sense uh Barcelo's view actually would be, if in that respect, a form of weak empiricism, uh, which would, and weak empiricism is perfectly compatible with the type of views that Descartes, Descartes really had. Now, I agree then if we uh, converge around that set of questions, there are emotional representations and perceptual representations. The question is when are they used? Uh, I think the next interesting empirical question, the one we should be focusing on, is what tasks, what context, what determines uh, uh, the use of which type of representation. And I, I, I actually view, in a sense, uh, actually, I, I wish that's where the debate would be moving. And you know, if that's where the debate is moving, I think uh, that would be just perfectly fine, just perfectly fine with me. I do worry about the surface versus deep contrast, which, in a sense, suggest that uh, real thinking involves perceptual representations. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure that's the right way to frame it. You know, if, if you look, for example, at uh, um, you know, the, the type of studies that Marina Bedney has done on mind reading, I'm not sure the surface versus deep contrast here is actually the right way of, of characterizing the type of tasks uh, her sighted and blind participants are, 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 are doing. I also do worry about the linguistic gadget. So that's something that both Jesse in his 2002 book and Barcelo in more recent work are very happy to, 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 to use. Says, well, we have something that looks like an emodal set of symbols and they're just linguistic representations. And I take it by linguistic representations, I mean representations involving natural languages, not, not, a, not a language of thought, right? Uh, so but we speak, I speak in French sometimes, sometimes I speak in English, you speak in English or whatever other language you speak. Um, now, I do worry about that because I think it, it, it does not fit very well with much of the evidence that we have and some of the evidence I've been describing in, in the paper and in the talk today. Uh, mind reading, you know, the uh, uh, involvement of the RTPG, the number sense, uh, all that are non-linguistic representations. And non the number sense is not linguistic in many ways, it's an analog representation and not, and, and, and not a digital representation. Uh, it's also found, uh, the same system is found in a range of non-linguistic creatures. Uh, so what we have here is uh, an, a form of emodal representation that's not linguistic. Uh, uh, not, not simply does not involve language, but it's not linguistic at all, it's not even a language of thought, uh, you know, it's a, uh, an analog form of representation. Uh, furthermore, when one looks at activation of the RTPG, uh, uh, that's really orthogonal to the position of a language, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, it's, it's clearly not connected to speaking English, French, or any, and anything like that, that's really at a, at a more fundamental level. And I, I do think so, the bed knee, Type of results suggest that uh, when one is mind, mind reading, one is not one is using the RTPG, and that the uh, uh, RTPG activation is by and large a model. It's independent of stimulus modality. Uh, so that actually suggests that uh, uh, the type of representations that are maybe less perceptual, or what I would want to say, a model, are actually not linguistic representation in the sense of involving natural languages. And furthermore, some of them may not be linguistic at all in the sense of being made of digital representations that are concatenated according to syntactic rules. So I, 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 so I do agree with the first part of the question. I do agree with where the debate should be moving on. I am still concerned with some of the way Barcelou uh, seems willing to frame the debate in terms of surface versus deep and in terms of identifying the non-perceptual or less perceptual, maybe as you would want to say, as linguistic representations. Uh, you don't, I can't hear you. Okay, now I can. Oh, sorry. It shows that I'm really bad at this. Um, <laughs> the, the software, maybe also philosophy, but um, so, uh, just, yeah, so great. Uh, real quick, I mean, I just want to sort of stress the fact that there's a range of positions kind of in the middle here, right? I so, so what Barcelou was primarily responding to is a kind of Fedorian language of thought picture where, you know, the uh, 
the, the primary engine of all the things that we do is, a, is an amodal system, uh, uh, photo and pollution, obviously. So, I mean, there's ways of, so I agree with you both about the surface and deep and about the language bit, but there are ways of sort of making a little bit of inroads towards, uh, uh, or, or a little bit more concession to amodal systems. So for instance, um, uh, uh, Elias Smith and Thagard have this recent view about semantic pointers, where you've got an amodal kind of n uh, hub node which you know the 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 language system can index, which is not itself part of the language system, but serves as a very sort of bare indexing for the much richer sort of modal, the much richer sort of modal stuff. So that's I, I think I actually think that that's totally a move that needs to be made, and I agree with you about that. But that's still you, I mean that's still only part of the way uh, towards uh, an a modal system. I think you can still get a very very robust empiricist picture and say that that's sort of so again by and large a lot of what's going on a lot of the time and then I but then I totally agree with you we can debate about what are the what the contexts are with the type of tasks yeah. yeah. good uh, let me just follow up on that so I, I I agree that between the two extreme positions that I've been focusing on there are all these interesting intermediate positions and some of which would actually count as uh, uh, very satisfying for someone who has empiricist leanings because it would show that uh, despite the fact that there are immoral concepts, so in, in that sense Descartes got something right, much of our thinking does not involve them. Much of our thinking involves perceptual representation. And I mean, quite bad news for Descartes, you know, in, 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 in some ways, and very bad news for a Fodorian Pelician type of, of view. So I, I think that's, that's why it's an interesting position here. Let me just highlight a very difficult question here that is raised by this moving the debate in that direction, one I don't have any answer for. Uh, uh, it's, so the, this type of question is a frequency type of question. How often that type of representation versus how often that type of representation gets to be used. And it's a very general type of debate, frequency debate. You find the same stuff in evolutionary biology. How often is natural selection involved in evolution versus how often non-selective processes are involved in natural selection. And you find the same debate again and again uh, in various areas of science. It's questions which are very hard to frame and study in the right way because we need to have the right reference class to identify, to answer the question how often. In the case of, of perception, it's going to be really tricky to answer the question because we would need a set of tasks that are representative of our life. You know, not the set of tasks that are representative of psychological tasks. You know, it may well be that most of the tasks that psychologists use happen to be using perceptual representation. But that's just the right answer, the wrong answer. The wrong question is, how often in life do we use perceptual representation versus a modal representation? And the worry here is that the type of task that happen to be used may be a very biased sample, not a representative sample. And, is, and, and now the question, of course, is how do you know whether you have a representative sample? Has anybody thought about the sampling of tasks from our natural uh, cognitive life? We don't have a theory about that. We don't have any way to answer this kind of question. I mean, Egon Brunswick, of course, had a theory about how to do that back in the 1950s. You know, he thought a lot about the natural sampling of tasks. Uh, but I think uh, cognitive psychologists and cognitive neuroscientists are, by and large, they're not very sensitive, I think, to that type of, of, of question. So if you move toward a frequency type of question, um, uh, I do worry that uh, we may be, it may be a question that's very hard to answer uh, for the type of uh, methodological problems I've been just alluding to. Yeah, thanks. But I really wanted to ask you more about the relationship between philosophical frameworks and scientific results because I'm, I'm greatly interested in this idea of how empiricism, rationalism, modalism figures in, in today's science. And early on in your, in your talk, you made the claim that we need operational tests as opposed to stipulation, and I, I couldn't agree more, and I think that's, a, that's an important point. But at the same time, it seems to me that there's two ways of seeing this, uh, this relationship. Let me try to very briefly cash them out, and I would love to know what, where you stand mm -hmm. on, on this issue here. On the one hand, one could say that science vindicates one framework over the other, and Jesse, you know, Jesse Prince, if I remember his book correctly, oftentimes talks along these lines. Basically, uh, you know, he thinks that new or relatively new scientific data 
vindicates um, old empiricist claims. And to some extent, you talked like that or like this early on in the claim too, when you said there's a sense in which Descartes is right. But at the same time, um, as you note, Prince empiricism is not Hume's empiricism. Prince says it's all about format, it's not about innateness, it's not about semantics. And even at the end of the talk, you said Descartes, by and large, was right. And this, this to me suggests a different way of interpreting what's going on. And so if, if on the one hand, science can vindicate framework, I think frameworks have a different, pass me the expression, more Kantian role in science, which is to systematize the data. And, and there's a sense in which, in this sense, there's a role for stipulation. Because here, empiricism and rationalism is not something that falls right out of, of the scientific experiment, but we need a framework to reinterpret this. And I'm, I'm intrigued by this, but stipulation no, here plays a much stronger role, because here we need some initial stipulation that, of course, following your lead, it has to be tested. But mm -hmm. there's, there's a more important a priori component. So uh, basically, my, my question is simply, where do you stand here? And if you could just elaborate just a little bit on the relationship between the philosophical framework and the data. And because I think the implication here is how do science and philosophy come together? Um, I know a lot of people would dismiss the question, but I'm just about to start reading your book in some detail. So I, b I believe <laughs> that you're not going to dismiss that specific question. How about that? Good, good, good. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it, it, it's a difficult question to answer generally. I, I think you and I probably would agree that uh, it's going to vary from place to place, you know. I mean, I, I suppose uh, there are circumstances in which, um, um, uh, uh, you know, there are circumstances in which we're going to be, science is going to be vindicating an original position in a debate as the debate was framed. I just suspect it's going to be the unusual situation, right? So we take a debate between Descartes and Hume, assuming they're not talking at cross purposes. As, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a historian of philosophy, but assuming that there is a clear sense in which they're addressing the same question. And we look at whether science provides an answer that supports one of the two positions in the very terms that the debate was framed. Uh, that's, I, I, I do think, to some extent, that some Jesse sometimes talks that way, and I did talk that way by and large today, I agree. Uh, another, I, I do think that's going to be the exception rather than the rule. Uh, a more common situation, uh, and that's not the one you, you contrasted uh, the vindicating, it's, an, it's a third position, is often the very terms of the debate will be dramatically changed. Uh, so we start, we start with a historical position, a historical debate framed in philosophical terms, and somehow the very terms of the debate actually change across time. And the question we're answering using modern scientific data just isn't exactly and sometimes isn't remotely the very questions that were asked at the beginning. Uh, and I, I, I do think that's often uh, what's happening. You know, there's a philosophical question and the answer we get from science has a family resemblance with the original positions to the original question. But really, it's at best a family resemblance. Uh, and I, and I, 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 I do think here uh, what's going on, you know, I mean, I, I don't do history of philosophy, uh, even though I'm a big fan of Depost Descartes and Hume. Uh, I, I, I do think what's going on is more the second type of, 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 of situation, that it's rarely the case that scientific data allow us to support a philosophical position as it was originally formulated, or as it was formulated uh, as an answer to an original philosophical question. Uh, uh, now, the question then is, how much of a family resemblance do you have? Are you just changing the topic, or are you still answering the same question? Now, it's a difficult to you know. When do you change the topic? When are you answering? You need a theory of topic continuity, uh, which is uh, something which is tricky to give. It's not impossible, actually. Uh, Herman Kaplan has a new book where he talks a lot about topic continuity, uh, a book coming out in a, in a few months. Uh, so, you know, that's possible philosophizing here, metaphilosophizing here to be done to try to answer some of these questions. Uh, I don't have a specific view about how much similarity is required for you to be answering still the same thing, roughly, in some sense, or entirely changing the, uh, the topic. But I do think 
that in most cases, even so you may be talking as if you were vindicating one of the original position, really you are actually uh, vindicating right. a position that has a familiar resemblance with your position. And I think Jesse would agree with that. You know, I mean, he's often talking as if uh, it was a great victory for David Hume. I'm talking as, you know, he's got, uh, when he was giving talks on concept 10 years ago, he had this picture of Hume that ended up smiling at the end because he was uh, using Photoshop or whatever. Um, uh, and I think I, I, I give a picture of Descartes at the end. But I think the truth is the terms of the debate have been subtly changed. Um, uh, and I think it becomes more and more obvious as we uh, realize that the interesting debate may not be so much about is it a modal or perceptual the way I, I was framing the debate, but if we but how much of our cognitive life depends on representations that are similar or identical or that is the same format as a representation we use in perception or some of the representation we use in perception and action. Uh, if that's the question we end up gravitating toward, then we moved beyond uh, the original, I mean, the question we're asking just isn't even at all the same as the question that Hume and uh, Descartes were, were interested in. And I think it's for an interesting philosophical reason, one that Fodor has always been keen on highlighting is that Classical philosophers were all about representations. They had very little to, to say about thinking. Uh, you know, they were, you know, Descartes was thinking, well, has a lot of things to say about abstract concepts and why they couldn't be reduced to perceptual concepts. David Hume has a lot of things to say about how we construct these perceptual, these uh, conceptual representations out of perceptual building blocks. Uh, but they told us very little about, okay, what are the processes involved in thinking and uh, as soon as, and so they didn't really have to answer the question about how frequent, right? Now, modern psychologists care as much about representation as they care about processing, uh, and as a result, um, and the two are, of course, interconnected in interesting and complex manner, uh, but as soon as you care about processing, the type of question about how frequent, in which context, what are the determinants that we use one type of representation rather than another, becomes the central question. And furthermore, we may have to move beyond the contrast between perceptual and emodal. You know, I've been using that as a way of framing the debate because I think it's a useful way to frame the debate at a specific stage of theorizing. But the worry is that as we're going to be moving ahead and looking at contexts in which we use these distinct types of representation, that's going to be a form, a distinction that's way too broad to answer the debate, way too, way too rough to answer the debate. We're going to need more subtle form of representation. So I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, instead of using your two options, vindicating or a framework of systematizing, I would say what's happening is that the frameworks actually change because the very questions we're asking happen to be changing. And I think that's actually the typical situation. How much change there is is going to be a context and it's going to depend from debate to debate. Thank yeah, you. That's, that's, that's my answer to your question. Oh, but now with respect to the question about stipulation, I think that's a really interesting question what the role of stipulation is in, in, in uh, scientific theorizing or theorizing more broadly. Is that a good strategy to start by stipulating a distinction and then use that distinction to try to make some progress in uh, organizing the data? Uh, uh, it's really a good question, and I, I don't, you know, it, it may, it, it does remind me, and I'm, I'm not sure whether you had that in mind. To uh, uh, it does remind me of uh, Friedman's work uh, uh, about definition. Uh, you know, I think there's a clear connection here between the notion of, stip, you know, stipulation and what Friedman says about definition as a tool to make, as you know, in a Kantian version, as a tool to to make good science. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting question. I don't have any answer to, 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 to that question. I think that's really worth thinking about uh, what's the role of stupidity definitions in a good, successful, naturalistic philosophical program or scientific, scientific program. Yeah, I think that's a very, uh, very uh, interesting philosophical question, metaphysical question. Uh, thanks for the talk, Edouard. It was really interesting. It's not, and I, I learned a lot, so it's not like a topic that I, that I, uh, worked on a lot and so my initial question was something about this sort of middle ground that uh, Dan and you were discussing and so I'm going to just skip that because I think that was already really really enlightening that sort of exchange about the middle ground between these two positions but I had another comment on sort of uh, 
em embodiment and embodied cognition approaches and this question. Um, because a at least from my perspective, it seems to me that, you know, th this question about concepts being uh, uh, modal or amodal is distinct from the from the question whether there are uh, parts of cognitive systems that are not in the you know not in the brain or whether it's like there are non neural parts uh, of the body or the environment that play some sort of operative role in cognitive processing which is sort of more the embodied embedded and active perspective on 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 cognition and what uh, cognition is and and it seems to me that that's that that's what 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 is one goal of sort of this this research program and this sort of more narrow question whether or not concepts are modal or amodal might be well that might well be consistent with with a with this sort of broader uh, uh, embodied cognition perspective and I was just wondering what <laughs> you share that sort of view of the debate or what your position in general is uh, both on, on this embodied research, uh, embodied cognition program and, and this relation between your, your debate or this debate about concepts and the debate about uh, neurocentrism versus some sort of extended mind or embodied cognition perspective. Good, thank you. Um, now, the first thing to say in response to that question is uh, to uh, remind you uh, that embodied is actually a multiply ambiguous word, and that embodied cognition refers to very different research programs, uh, which are often actually, unfortunately, poorly distinguished by uh, both embodied researchers and their opponents. There's a classic paper by Margaret Wilson in 2002 in a psychonomic bulletin and review called Six Views of Embodied Cognition, where she's very helpfully actually distinguished six very different claims uh, that have been made in the literature that are very different from one another and that clearly should not be confused. Uh, and so some of the people that I've, I'm focusing on, Basalu and Thompson Shield and Martin, do call their views uh, embodied cognition, but they're really just concerned about the nature of the brain bound representation. So in that sense, uh, they would be, uh, according to one classification, they would not be embodied people, right? They would be actually mostly focusing on, they would be neurocentric, neurocentric researchers. So the, so the notion of embodiment, just in a nutshell, here's the notion of embodiment here uh, is used in many different ways. But it is true, of course, there is this uh, view out there that argues that part, uh, maybe more better characterized by, an ex by the notion of extension, uh, that part of the cognitive system is not in the brain. It involves uh, the body and maybe even the physical environment out there. Um, now, um, I tend to be um, a little bit skeptical of the very debate itself, uh, mostly because it involves uh, most of the best arguments in this area involve claims about the nature of uh, claims about the meaning of the relevant concepts, the concept of belief. You need to have a functional characterization of this concept, and what are the uh, systems that are fulfilling this functional characterization of the concept of belief. Uh, and you know, Clark, of course, the original Clark and Chambers paper clearly involves this kind of argument in some of Clark's more recent work about before he moved to uh, predictive coding. Uh, uh, there was also a, a, a lot of discussion of this uh, functional, of the right functional characterization of the relevant concept. And I do think uh, these debates are a little bit silly, frankly. Uh, I, I do think uh, nobody has any idea about what the right functional characterization, depending on how you characterize the functional content of a given concept, you end up with a broader or larger system, brain bound or not brain bound. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure uh, how much hangs on that type of, 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 of argument. Now, that's one type of, so is the claim is which part of the world are constitutive of the cognitive system, of the cognitive system. I do worry that uh, the debate is hangs on 
providing what the right functional characterization of the psychological concept and I'm very skeptical of that project. Now, here are some more interesting debates in this area, one which is really uh, important. is If you want to do good psychology, how much should you pay, how much attention should you pay to the environment and to the coupling of uh, brain processes and non-brain processes? So that, I think, is a fascinating question. Uh, you know, uh, if, for example, if you want to specify a mass level, uh, a mass three level task, uh, should you be focusing on properties of the environment or can you by and large abstract about the environment? Uh, if you want to be thinking about cognitive processes, how much of the coupling between your dynamics and uh, dynamics in the, or in events in the world should you pay attention to? So that, I think, are the interesting question in this area. It is quite distinct from uh, the question of which, what, uh, whether parts of the non-brain world in are constitutive of the cognitive system. It's a distinct type of question. In my mind, it's a really interesting kind of question. Um, and they are distinct from the type of question Basalu and uh, others are interested in, which are really about the format of representation and are consistent with a very neurocentric approach to, to, uh, to, to the mind. Now, with respect to the second set of questions, um, to the set of questions which I find most interesting in the embodiment debate, I tend to be uh, of the view that uh, you can't do good psychology and you can't do cognitive neuroscience if you don't pay attention, on, on the one hand, to uh, the broader social and physical environment. So I've been very influenced by Egon Brunswick in the 1950s, and also more recently by the work done by Giganzer and colleague about ecological rationality. And ecological rationality really starts with a view that to specify the right tasks for the mind, you need to study the environment. And of course, Simon metaphor of the Caesar, you know, one, one, one part of the Caesar is the mind, one part of the Caesar is the environment. And you can't have a theory of cognition without studying how the two parts mesh with one another is of the same kind, right? And furthermore, the idea is that you can't study brain dynamics without paying attention to events outside the brain strikes me also as right. So as far as I'm concerned for the question which I think is the most important uh, for having a good theory of cognition and a good theory of the brain, I tend, to, I, I tend to side with some versions of embodied cognition, but very different from the more metaphysical Clark and Chalmers style um, uh, embodied cognition. It's very different from the Basalu style. It's also very different from some of the research that goes on in psychology under the heading embodied cognition. Uh, so, uh, this is a very big picture. So, <laughs> uh, so one uh, very attractive feature of neoempiricism is that, to me at least, is that uh, it makes it very easy to answer the question how a concept are acquired. Um, at least, you know, it gives you um, a handy story that tells you, well, we have um, a perceptual representation and a kind of operation that you can perform on them, or, you know, linking them, binding them, like merging them. Uh, um, so that's uh, something that uh, some people may find appealing uh, in contrast with uh, a view that, like yours, requires mm -hmm. a translation process of some sort, right? Um, so traditionally, this sort of view seems to come with some real consequences. Like, so for example, you may think that translation requires a meta language that the subject already possesses, and so you know, uh, consideration like those have led other mm -hmm. to think that you know, concepts are innate, maybe some are, and so on. Um, so. You know, I, I'm just curious what, you know, how you're thinking about this transition process in such a way that you may be um, anticipating those kind of big picture worries that <coughs> are back in the mind of many new employees. Good. Great, great, great. Uh, so, <coughs> um, Two things. The first one is that, uh, so I agree with your, uh, 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 with your point. I think you, you, you're exactly right to uh, uh, argue that um, an empiricist approach to concept has a very handy story to concept acquisition and that, uh, in a sense, uh, someone like Fodor or me need to have a story about, well, where does this language come from or where does this set of representational tools come from that we use to translate 
uh, perceptual representations. And I think that's absolutely true. Just one small caveat. Of course, even an empiricist theory can be a nativist for some concepts, right? Yeah, uh, she may well say, look, we have perceptual representations that are innate. And indeed, there's good evidence for templates involving in uh, perception of snakes, for example. Uh, but uh, so that's, that's a prima facie contrast. On the other hand, when you think a little bit about it, I do worry that the situation is very, it's not that different from one another. So, you know, I, I, I for, for the two, for, for, the, for the two positions, I'm, and I'm not really sure because I haven't thought about your, your, your question beforehand, uh, but here's what maybe I, I, I may be leaning to, to say. Um, what's the take home lesson from Fodor? Well, the take home lesson from Fodor is that the representational resources one has in thinking are fixed. You know, we can't acquire those, right? So we, we have a, a set of primitives that we are, you know, that we know in a sense, we don't learn whatever learning really amounts to. Now we can learn concepts provided that concepts just are in some way combination of these primitive resources. Uh, so we can learn concepts, but we can't learn the primitive resources that we use in primitive computational resources. So that we find, in a sense, <laughs> a maybe gigantic set, a space of possible concepts we may have, but outside this space, unthinkable, you know, uh, and, and nothing that can be built out of these primitive resources is part of a, uh, uh, we, we, can, we, we can't think it. Um, and, and that's, that's, you know, what, I, I, I don't like the notion of innateness, but that's what Fodor called call innate, I would say unlearnable, which does not help very much because God knows what learning means. But uh, in any case, but I'm doing one is that, uh, so I need a story about that, where that comes from. Well, I think, I think that's part of the fundamental structure of the brain. I agree with Fodor. But I think the, the empiricist is in the same boat, except the empiricist thinks that the fundamental structure, the fundamental set of resources is given by, on the one hand, the representational resources involved in perception, and second, some form of attentional selection mechanism. So they too actually are bounding the space of possible sorts by appealing to a, a, a complex set of, of primitive representational resources except we don't think it's the same set. They think it's a set that is involved in perception. I think it's another set, another set of, of primitive resources, right? Uh, so we are both committed to, on the one hand, a learned set of primitive resources, not the same one. Well, I'm committed to two, right? Or two or more, right? I, I, I must have one more, I must have more than they had. So, uh, but they too are committed to a very strong limit to uh, what, we are, what we actually can think, except it's just not the same one as I have. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there's still a difference though between okay. the two because uh, I would say that the, the, the empiricists also appeal to uh, primitives, but those are kind of more like grammar-like, structural-like imperatives, like operational, you know, merging, linking. True. Uh, so those are kind of uh, a little bit like, uh, the syntax, you know. The, no, true. Whereas, true, true. whereas you need a period, uh, uh, like semantic primitives, like you need right. building blocks. Uh, That's of, right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think yeah. This no, 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 no. I, I, well, yeah, I, I agree with you. But what I wanted to say is that, be, you know, if, if you think that uh, representations, yeah, which are involved in perception, <laughs> also form languages, you know, they have formats. So if, or if, and if you don't like to talk in terms of languages because you don't think that discrete representations, which are concatenated according to some syntactic rules, not the right way to think about it, they need a set of representations uh, uh, with a specific format involving the, involved in the representation. And because the concepts are in some way going to be derived from those according to complex rules, these perceptual representations also define the space of oh, possible yeah. source. Yeah. And, and what we can perceive is the structure of thought for them to ex ex Exactly. So we, we're both committed to different but really uh, 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 strong innateness claims, except that I think, 
somehow the space of thought is different from the space of perception. They think the space of, the space of perception constrains the space of thought. Uh, so we both actually are committed to some form of thought-oriented views about innateness. Just not the same, just not the, not, not the same one. And if you think about it that way, it's kind of less bad to be an immortal theorist. It's not like you're taking on this crazy claim about the limitations of thought and unlearned primitive representational resources. Everybody's taking on that claim, except you're not making you're not making um, um, the same claims about um, primitive representational resources. Uh, so, so you know, it, it's bad, but it's bad for everybody. So, <laughs> so that's you know, that's not so bad after all. So. Yeah, that's, that's the type of response I've been trying to make. Yeah. Um, I actually have a, a worry that's just the, in the reverse direction from the previous worry. So, uh, <laughs> and this has to do with how, how offloading is supposed to work. Um, so I, I think um, in the limit, it's true that you can have exactly the same content represented in a, in a, perceptual format, whatever it is, and in a, in a amodal format. I just think, um, in, in point of fact, that's often not the case. Um, and even if it were the case, you would have special problems trying to go back from thought happening in the amodal system to thought happening um, in the perceptual system. So there's one, I mean, I, so I've written about this actually in, in relation to cognitive penetration and these kinds of claims. Um, the way I want to put the worry in this context is to say, well, how does offloading work? So you're thinking, you're thinking in your amodal system, and the, and the amodal system, and I'm going to put this really vaguely, uh, decide that some offloading is is appropriate in this scenario. Um, but what system should it what system should it offload to? What exact processes in those in that system is required? Um, I'm on I'm of the position that purely amodal uh, uh, concepts, due to the form difference, actually lack the resources to pick out very precise um, processes in, in, the, um, in the modal system. And if, you, and if you agree with me about that, then maybe offloading is not really the right view. So I've got a position on which, on which it's uh, a much more brute uh, associationist now in the top-down direction, where you might get some sort of priming effects uh, but you're not going to get very specific effects um, in the modal in the modal system. And if that's the case, then then it's not like all the thinking is happening in the in the amodal system and it's just offloaded. There's a much more complex kind of interaction effect. Great, great, great. Um, so, um, so I, I agree with uh, the first things you said. So it's possible, of course, to have two formats to encode the same content exactly you know the example of uh, uh, two ways to encode uh, numerals uh, you know as now so it's possible but it's not necessary uh, we can have indeed dif different languages with different primitives and th there may be no no way to exactly translate or translate at all what's going on in one and two what's going on in the other so i think that's absolutely true it's possible but not always uh, the case um, uh, so I agree. I agree uh, with that, uh, and I also also agree that you sketch a picture of the interaction between perceptual and conceptual, or modal and immodal representations. That's very distinct from the offloading hypothesis. Uh, so the offloading hypothesis has a very clear engineering flavor, right? So it's opt it's not, maybe not maybe optimal, but it's satisfying it works well it's a well designed system um, you know in some circumstances maybe because it's efficient we're going to be using that system in other circumstances we're going to use this representation so it does require some story here about how this uh, uh, engineering or this uh, satisfying uh, um, uh, uh, division of labor text Take, takes place, right? And I don't have a story to tell there because it's a, very, it's a, a sketch of an idea rather than a scientific hypothesis uh, that I put forward. But at the very least, I think what is true is that it does contrast very neatly with the type of associa associationist and priming views that you have, where the relation between a modal and modal representation, so distinct types of representation, if we go beyond these labels, is just one of association and, and, and uh, different types of, of relation priming, priming each, each other. It's not an engineering picture. It's just the outcome of, on the one hand, a history of thinking together with fundamental principles uh, associating 
representations. Very different type of picture does not require a mass, so to speak, a mastermind organizing the division of labor between systems according to uh, red sort of efficient principles. Uh, so I think what's nice here is that we have at least not necessarily super specific hypotheses. Um, I know the, you know, you are a story about uh, what drives the priming association. You know, so there's probably already more exist, more work to be done there. Our story about, um, and there's probably less work down here. It's less. It's even more. It's very sketchy. Our story about um, what happens when and what's the mechanisms that allows what to happen when. Uh, and I don't have that. Uh, so, but at least we have two competing stories here that can make sense of. The puzzle I started with, because it's very clear that there is interactions and that perceptual representations are part of cognitive processing, at least sometimes, and maybe as we talked to, as we exchanged earlier, often. Uh, so, so at, at least that's very nice that we have two broad ideas here, which are clearly different from one another, and that can be specified in more detail. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't have any answer to, 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 to your question. I mean, you has strong advantages uh, in its favor is that there's already, of course, quite a, a lot of work on, on associations, quite a lot of work, work on priming here that you can, it seems to be a more minimalist story that you can actually appeal to. And so a lot of work that you can appeal to to flesh out uh, the, the hypothesis and also more minimalist. So it has uh, maybe uh, additional parsimony, uh, uh, parsimony may actually an additional virtue of, 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 of your theory. Now to contrast them, what I would need to do is, and uh, what I don't do in the paper, is sketch out in much more detail um, some principles about when and also uh, some um, uh, mechanisms. Uh, and I, I don't have any story here. It, of course, it, it ties with control, you know, uh, you know wh what's your theory of control about what system governs thinking at what time. Uh, very difficult question uh, to, to answer when one is theorizing about cognition. But yeah, yeah, I think that you're right to press me about that that that, that question. I, I really like that. Yeah. By, by the way, you should send me a, a, uh, you send me your paper when you where you write where, where you write about that. At the, uh, I was going to do that anyway, even if you didn't ask. So. Okay. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, we we got time for a few questions. I have a question, if I may. Okay, okay please. So uh, in, in the article, you seem to accept the, the classical uh, neuroanatomical uh, tests to disambiguate the issues about the representation of form, so, yeah. which is based on the traditional distinction between associative and perceptual cortex. Yeah. So according to this criterion, if a given task uh, uh, critically involves an area which is uh, clearly perceptual, such as these were the regions, then it means that in the middle there is uh, perceptual representations, while uh, if uh, it critically involves uh, an associative area, that it means that it probably involves a model representation. You recognize that, uh, uh, which is only, uh, it is not a deficit test. You have to use also other behavioral data, for instance, in a sort of inference to the best explanation. And you also recognize that there is no principal distinction between uh, uh, associative and perceptual cortex. For instance, take the temporal lobe, is it perceptual or not? Take the frontal lobe, is it perceptual or not? Now, I'm wondering whether, but you say also that there are clear cases, this neuro, neuroanatomical test is useful because there, because there are clear cases of perceptual and associative cortex. Now, I'm wondering whether there are actually clear cases of associative cortex, and so if there are actually clear evidence in favor of the model, of the model view of concept. Now, it, think, it seems to me that it depends, of course, on the kind of criteria you use to define an associative cortex. For instance, a natural one would be a given area is associative to whether it is, we have no evidence that it is involved in direct perception. But if you take this criteria, maybe all the area that you mentioned in favor of the model view of concepts are not actually uh, associative, but are perceptual. For instance, you mentioned the intraparietal sulcus that seems to be involved in numerical cognition independently of the stimuli, of the perceptual stimuli. And, uh, um, but this region is also being associated with visual imagery, with visual working memory, and more importantly with visual processing. 
And also the uh, ATL, so anterior temporal lobe, have been involved in perceptual, in particular in visual perception. So it seems that if you take this criterion to decide if an area, if a given area is associative or not, maybe all the area are perceptual, and so there are no clear evidence in favor of the other. You seem to propose another criterion to decide is a if a given area is a modal, uh, namely the fact that the region in a given tract responds to stimuli in more than one perceptual, dependent of the modality. For instance, in the case of the interparietal sulcus, it seems that response to numerosity in both visual and auditory domain. But again, I'm wondering whether this criterion is too inclusive, it's too weak, because there are a growing body of evidence that suggests that even early uh, sensory cortex actually responded more than one visual stimuli. For instance, uh, the, mm, the visual cortex response also to tactile stimuli, and mm -hmm. uh, the auditory cortex response also to uh, visual and tactile stimuli. And uh, usually the, the answer is uh, that maybe some of this region or all this region are involved in, uh, for instance, shape processing or movement processing without independently of the stimuli. So if you take the criteria you propose, you seem to propose that maybe the distinction between associative and perceptual uh, uh, cortex simply collapse, and there is no evidence at all either for the perceptor or the emotional cause. So my question is uh, very general, so maybe also complex. So if, if you have in mind another criterion to, def to define a region as associative or not, and if you agree that if you have no clear criterion to distinguish between perceptual and associative cortex, even the traditional evidence in favor of the emotional concepts are a bit out of the point. All right, cool, cool. Um, so let me just so I, I may have gone a bit fast in the paper, and I don't remember, and I surely did in the talk, I remember. Um, I really, I, the, the, the first type of test for you, uh, using neuroscientific data is mostly a test in favor of empiricism. So I was not assuming that there are clear associative non-perceptual areas. Uh, and I think largely for the reason you, 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 you mentioned, because it's very hard to find a criterion that would single those out. But I was assuming that there are clear perceptual areas. We can come back to that. So I was thinking, so the thought here was, was that, oh, here's a test that the immodal theories cannot use. You know, it's, 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 it's not a test that's uh, useful for the emotional theories because there's no part of the brain that uncontroversially associative. But it's a test that the empiricist can use. Uh, so it was a resource for the empiricist because um, uh, if there's thinking involves activity in those areas, then it's a, it's a victory for the empiricist and a loss. For, or evidence for empiricism again. So that, that's in a sense the way I was thinking about that Task. Uh, now, um, how to identify those? Well, I don't have a theory about that, and I think you're right to press me. Um, you know, involved in perception, as you say, it's just not going to work. You know, much of the brain is involved in perception somehow. You know, it's, it's very hard to find a part of the brain that's just not in some context involved in some way in perception. You know, we, we know that attention is involved in, perce in perception. We know the prefrontal cortex is involved in attention. So the prefrontal cortex is going to be involved in perception in some way. So I think it's a whole brain, really. Uh, well, nearly the whole brain is going to be involved in, in, in perception sometimes, somehow. Uh, so that's not going to work. Uh, um, uh, respond to one type of stimulus may not work uh, even for the reason you, 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 you've mentioned, you know, much of the areas in uh, the visual stream uh, in response to uh, other modalities. I think you, you, you're, you're, right, you're right about that. Uh, um, I mean, so the worry here is that, um, you know, so now I've clarified what I've done here, I've clarified the way I've intended to use the principle, but I think the worry also bears about my intended use of the principle because it may not be actually that there are uncontroversially perceptual areas. Uh, so I, I think the, the, the worry actually also applies to my intended use of the criterion. Um, 
Um, um, well, if you take seriously some body of evidence, uh, even primary perceptor are multi yeah. and so that's also using the, the, the neuroatomical criteria to to argue in favor of perceptual symbols could be problematic. That's right. Uh, so I think, I think that would be one possible outcome. So other possible outcome, uh, which would require greater specification of the test. So uh, there could be different ways in which um, various modalities are influencing, or various stimuli belonging to different modalities are influencing an area. So I suppose uh, uh, maybe uh, the story here it would have to be something like uh, the influence of auditory stimuli on uh, shape perception uh, is distinct from the way auditory stimuli and visually stimuli have an influence on numerosity perception and, or numerosity representation, for example. Uh, so there have to be, in a sense, if I want to be able to use that test as a way to um, identify evidence for one of the two views, as a very solid evidence for empiricism, right, and in these perceptual areas, and I'd have to find a distinction between the multimodal nature of maybe early visual processing or visual processing and the multimodal nature of uh, maybe a, a magnitude representation in IPS. Uh, now, whether that's doable, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked enough at the uh, literature on multimodality here to, uh, to tell you whether that's something that's, that's doable. If it's not doable, I think that's a bad outcome for uh, the use of this test in that debate. Does that mean the debate becomes meaningless? Does that mean, I, I didn't mean that test to be definitional, I meant the test to be just one piece of evidence. Does that mean we need to use some of the other form of evidence? I'm trying to write an article on that, and maybe I will send to you for you, you must. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. We hope you, uh, we, we see you all again, and um, thank you for everything. Thank you again, Edward. Thank you again, guys. Thank you all. Thanks, Edward. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.